Unfortunately, we have to earn a living. So we're gonna be here at Xtech Engineering today to dyno a five liter V8 supercar engine on a dyno, so, which we filmed earlier. So, and after that, we're gonna do a bit of a tour of this place here. So please like and subscribe. Hope you enjoy the video. Have to earn a living so today we're actually out on site doing some mapping with paul from xtech engineering so we're doing a v8 supercar engine on the engine dyno and we're going to make some noise today so yeah please like and subscribe and follow along hi i'm paul from xtech engineering i've been running xtech for nearly 20 years now we're just here with dave from eps uh, we've got a, a touring car engine from an australian supercar on the dyno that we've just rebuilt so we we go through the procedure of running running the engine in uh, making sure we've got no leaks no obvious problems and then we go on to the mapping and power testing which is why dave is here with our motec system and away we go yeah cool so you've been building engines for a long time haven't you paul well, just right. a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and Honestly, this is the best way to test an engine, isn't it? It is definitely, yeah. yeah, yeah. You get the you get the chance to obviously you've got rolling roads and things like that, but we're for our as we primarily build engines, we get the chance to just prove that there's no, as I said, no obvious things with oil leaks before it goes in the car and causes the customer headaches. And uh, yeah, so this is our preferred way of doing it. Hmm. And and the main thing with any race engine is the braking procedure, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. what would you typically do for most engines for a braking procedure? Uh, basically, we, we tend to give them, um, we, we get them up to temperature, um, depending on what the engine's had. If, for example, this engine's had a new cam and pistons and, and quite a lot of internal components. So this we'll get this up to temperature and then put some load onto the engine and, and let it run at maybe two and a half thousand revs for the best part of 45 minutes to an hour. And, and that's the braking procedure done, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to be honest, like the, the engine dyno is the best for it because because the engine's fully exposed, we can kind of, if there's any leaks, if there's any like, you know, bits and pieces that we need to modify, it can be done. You know, like it, we're not, you know, you're not scrapping around in the car and whatever to, to try to find these sort of problems really. And, and then typically after a typical dyno session, what do you then do afterwards? Well, once we've got the engine off and back to the workshop, we, um, with an engine like this, a pushrod engine, we'll go through the, the um, tappet settings, we'll get, take the filters out, the scavenge system on the oil system to make sure there's no, no obvious problems with it, with the engine at all. Give it a look down the bores with the bore scope and to give yeah, it a clean bill of health. Yeah, it off really, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know, so, yeah. And, and one of the things as well, like, you know, when they sort of run on this dyno and there's, like making sure that there's no leaks and whatever, you can quickly nip those in a butt because as it, Andrew it goes a bit crazy if you leave any coolant <laughs> stains on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a good way to, you can make work for yourself if you're not careful. If you if you have got a little leak, you've got to sort it out. So yeah, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's the best way to prove it. Yeah, hundred percent. And so, and so th this dyno here, like this allows the engine to start, run, and Paul can then control the engine speed that the um, engine will sit at. And we could also do power tests and measure the horsepower and torque for when we're doing the final tuning at the end. So th this dyno is basically a massive water break. And so that water break basically limits the, the load and the engine speed on the, on the actual engine. So um, with that, the dyno speed can be set at different rpm points and then we can go through to, on the motec we can go to different rpm and load points and and map every sort of individual part of the engine sort of settings really so it just allows for like a really good job and it's under the most extreme condition that the engine will sort of be under so when it goes and bit gets put back into the car it can then be just like quickly checked just to make sure that everything's okay and um you're going to hit the racetrack running because a lot of these engines are very specialized engines aren't they you yeah. do a lot of like group c engines yeah. Yeah. historic formula one yeah. we've even done four cylinder yeah we do, formula we, one yeah as a company we we do quite a lot of 
um, one-off engines. So, uh, but a lot of Group C engines, the Porsche turbo engines and Mercedes turbo engines, but also some 60s, 60s Formula One engines, and uh, quite a variety really. What's your favourite? Um, the, uh, the Porsche. We do a lot of Porsche engines, so they're they're, yeah. they're pretty good, aren't those? But then the Cosworth. The Cosworth DFE engine, the Formula One engine of the 70s and 80s, is a is a nice engine to build because it it just fits nicely. Everything fits. So, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
They did originally have the uh, V8 twin turbo from the Esprit, yeah, yeah. but that didn't seem so successful, so they, yeah. they changed to this engine. Um, it runs again through the original series. It has to run through air restrictors, so it's limited to around 650 horsepower. Okay. Um, what, what size are the air restrictors? They are 33 and a half millimeters, two of them. So you got that amount of power yeah. through two little holes. Yes, yeah. yep. So the, yeah. the engine runs quite high compression, and yeah. as with yeah. a lot of restricted engines, so yeah. you, you gain some, you lose some. Yeah, so, definitely, uh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. What sort of fuel and stuff is it on then? Uh, well, this will run Sunoco uh, um, GT GT260 fuel, so it's a higher octane, 105 mm -hmm. octane fuel. Um, again, a little bit of its availability. We are going to have to be moving over to um, synthetic fuels very shortly. Yeah, true. Especially with this remap as well. Yeah, so especially <laughs> with this, the championship are heading that way even in the, by 2025. Yeah. So, um, but we're yeah, it's getting close. It'll soon come round, won't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be a, a change yeah. again. Yeah. Um, and then mated to a, a Hewland um, six-speed sequential gearbox, um, which is used in a few GT1 cars of the era. Mm. Uh, yeah. And this one's actually um, still mechanical shift, isn't it? It so is, yes. Yeah. Full sequential, but still mechanical, so it's got a lever and yeah. you yeah. feel like a man when you're driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the paddle shifts weren't quite around when this car was... Um, was, era. was yeah. made yeah yeah fair play yeah. fair play yeah um and then we it's, it's got carbon fiber brake discs and brakes um these are uh, ap as you can see they're quite expensive things a set of brakes this car is approaching twenty five thousand pounds now um again they're retrofitted to suit the car so yeah the costs keep going up unfortunately cheap you think your car's cheap <laughs> sorry you think your car's expensive <laughs> then you have to buy brakes <laughs> for your race car yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So. So, how much would the whole car be looking at roughly? Um, it's a little bit uh, with the Lotus. A little bit difficult because there are they are so rare. There's only six of them built, and there there isn't there's one for sale at approaching a million pounds at the currently. Um, which for a GT1 car, in my mm. mind, is quite good value for money. If you look at other manufacturers of car, maybe a Porsche or a Mercedes, those GT1 cars from the same area are are 10 times that value. So, um, yeah, if you want a, a cheap GT1 car, a Lotus GT1, is the way to go. It? Yes, it's the way forward, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how how many hours do you think you've taken to... To get to this stage, the engine is probably, it's probably 200 hours in rebuilding the engine. Um, with the And then the car probably has another five or 600 hours on top of that. Yeah. Um, it's been repainted, as I say, yeah. it's been fully stripped and, and um, rebuilt. Yeah. But e even the paint job, Normandale's done it. It does, yeah, Normandale's so done it. So Normandale's have repainted it for them, and um, the owner of this vehicle, he doesn't like graphics, so all the graphics yeah. have been hand-painted yes. onto the vehicle. Yeah. And so, so there's no, like, lumps and bumps where stickers are and stuff like that it's all submerged into the paint and it just looks to die for yeah you know? yeah no, it does it so, does finish it off nicely yeah it's, it's and again really the paint job is the first thing everyone sees so it, it finishes the car yeah. off nicely yeah so this is one of your go-to favorites isn't it it is sense? yeah a porsche 962 engine um this is a water-cooled variant a 3.2 liter um we've done quite a few of these engines uh, again this one's ready to go out to the customer. We ran it on the dyno uh, probably two or three weeks ago, yeah, didn't we? Yeah, it had a new Motec Christmas. system and um, all went very well. So yeah, all ship shape, ready to go. Yeah, so, I mean, when you build this, obviously you just can't go to Porsche and buy the parts. How much of this do you have to remanufacture yourself? Uh, well, it's quite a few little parts. So we have the we have the rotating parts made, the crankshaft rods, pistons, valves, springs, all, all those sort of parts. The some of the castings are available from Porsche. The the main crankcase is a common common part to another another Porsche car. So um, but after that we're into uh, making just about everything else now. Um, about five or six years ago, we ran into a problem of running out of the cylinder barrels. Um, there just were no more. We'd, we'd used some second-hand ones with varying degrees of success. So we just had to bite the bullet and um, make some new ones. Because there, there's no head gasket on this, is there? No, no. The, um, the actual barrel and head 
is all one piece. Yeah. And so machining of the valves and all that stuff is done through the actual barrel itself. It is, it? yeah. So. Yeah, um, well, I can show you one. We've got one here that we, this is one of the ones we manufacture. Um, so as Dave said, the valves go inside there and the, obviously the piston assembly all goes in um, as you build the engine. Um, we, as I say, we started this project um, about six, seven years, well, six years ago, and I think that we are now on our, on probably our eighth set now of fitted to engine successfully. So, um, but this is, it may not look much, but there's a lot of work gone into this. We work with another company called Engine Developments in Rugby to, to manufacture this, and um, it's been a, a great success. Because one of the things as well is like the early, the early Group C engines stuff as well, that the, because they're doing sprint races and they're not really full endurance now, are they? Because the races are actually a little bit shorter, the um, the power level is actually going up, isn't it? It is, yeah. So some of these some of these current Group C spec engines are actually making way more power than yeah. than what you know they did before, really. Yeah. So it, in period, the Group C regulations are the fuel formula, so you were given X amount of fuel to complete X amount of hours racing, whereas now they generally do a 40, 45 minute race and um, you, most of the cars are 90, 90 litres and that's enough to run them at quite a lot more boost, especially the turbo cars are gaining yeah, gain quite a lot. Definitely. So this may run in the, in the historic races with, um, like Porsche engines can run up with up to 800 horsepower, whereas in period for a, you know, a thousand kilometre race or 24 hour race, they may be more right around below 600 to uh, get through the fuel, to, so they don't use all the fuel up. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Cost-wise, what would this be worth if you wanted to build a dressed Group C engine? Um, if you can buy the parts. If you can buy the parts, there's still some. We do make a lot of the parts, of the barrels, the cam carriers, this that, and the others. The inlet manifold parts we haven't made so much of yet, but it's a um, 250, 300 thousand pound engine as it as as they sort of sit there. If you wanted to buy that engine, if the owner would ever sell it, which they probably wouldn't. Hmm. Because you can't buy another one. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know? So it's yeah. No one can really put a price on them at the moment. Yeah. So this this is a three point two liter. It has individual throttle bodies, and it's turbocharged. So we have a a bit of a special mapping strategy on this as well. So one of the things that we um, like to do is we when we map this engine, we we actually make it. Um, four dimensional mapping. So we have up to five different fuel maps for the different throttle blade angles being turbocharged. So it's um, quite important to do all the dyno properly and stuff like that. And when you do this 4D mapping for this type of engine, they drive so well, you know, because every race car and every like dyno video that you see, everything's flat out. and it's not always the case when you're actually out on track. So you're always part throttle, like, you know, modulating the power through the corners and stuff like that. So that's something we do with this engine that's quite special, really. It, is, it, yeah. it really works well, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, we've, we've come a long way with the, the way we've developed the maps and stuff like that. And and as well, like, you, we converted the car from Bosch, didn't we, from a while back. And around Silverstone, I think we saved about two litres per lap the fuel on the Motec system with a 4D mapping compared to it was on the old school Bosch system. Mm. And it's the same track, but yeah, two liters a lap in, in saving in fuel, that's, you know, that's good because it's not all going through the engine. It's not wearing the engine out. It's not just going out the tailpipe, you know, making flames, you know, all those cool stuff. But yeah, it's, stuff's moved on a bit hasn't it yeah yeah and then you know that's kind of why it's great with the stuff that xtec do with like the barrels and stuff like that and um camshafts and all sorts of stuff like every little bit is all just gets little tweaks as it goes along really and um it, it's it works really well so, yeah yeah and going back to the mapping one the thing with these cars of this area and, and the historic racing they run in now they there's no driver aids there's no traction control that's right, yeah. So it's even Definitely. more important that the, you know, the, the, map, the engine mapping's got to work correctly because it's, yeah, it's a, lot of, a lot of work to drive one of these cars. Yeah, 
Yeah, you've driven one, haven't you? Yes, yeah, yeah, once or twice. But yeah. yeah, yeah, lucky enough to have one of the owners to trust me with his car to do a race at Donington, but yeah, really good. And he obviously didn't crash it. <laughs> no, still, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's still a customer. He's, he's still a customer <laughs> as well, so yeah. he must have done a good job, yeah. you know. But yeah, nah, so yeah, that's it really. So, hmm. thanks very much. I'm sure we'll put a link to Xtech Engineering in the video, and um, yeah, see you soon. I think he's gone now. This is taking a bit longer than I thought. Um, is, is Dave paying for this? Because we could just put x -Tech on this and, That's not a bad shot, and call it mine, couldn't we? Don't, don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs>